What is up, Diggity Doe? What is up, Diggity Doe? Uh, my name is Adam. Welcome to the fourth episode of Pixel Roll, where we uh, talk about all things uh, the best basketball team in the history of the face of the Earth planet, the the Washington Washington Wizards. Joining my co-host, uh, the man of many vines and uh, a curator of uh, Manor Time, Mr. Kyle uh, Weida. What's up, dude? Oh, what is going on? I'm not sure how proud I should be about the curation of Manor Time. Um, that seems to be a very <laughs> unproud moment at, at this point. But uh, not bad. It's a Tuesday in D.C., and it's it. they shut down the city today, and it snow didn't stick anywhere, and here we are. <laughs> Although I went to work, so we'll take that. As, as, as did I. It, it's a... Uh... I guess if they, they it snows during rush hour, everything goes crazy. I, I felt as a Midwesterner that the, the D.C. has gotten a lot better with these snow things, and today was a bad bad example <laughs> where they're kind, of, they're kind of regressing to the mean, if you want to use. If I you think want to use, uh, uh, hold on real quick. I, I don't know. I think it's kind of a backhand. Yeah, sorry. No, of, if, if, if you want to use the NBA working again. type. It's like a backhanded way of like the government <laughs> shut down again. It's like, all right, let's no one works, and then of course everyone follows the government's federal rules, and it's like, you know, the fiance didn't have to go to work today, and I'm sitting there great. I'm let me get on the bus. So, yeah, she's giving me a look. Although, all right, so yeah, we have no, our no, snow, no, no, we have our snow beanies on, and I, I'm representing the bullets, so it's 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 okay. You're you're good. I'm I'm glad that Kai is uh, staring you down. That that makes this podcast, this makes this uh, video show. We've we've made it now. We've we've made it. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about the Wizards. Last time we recorded uh, was was two weeks ago. The Wizards were on the 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 brink of potentially a make or break, another make or break week with four games. They beat the Lakers at home. John Wall shows out. They go. They win an ugly game in Milwaukee. Get kind of destroyed in Indiana. And come back and uh, win, uh, beat the Hawks at home, right. and had another successful game. They beat the Magic, and all of a sudden, before you know it, Kyle, the uh, the, the Washington Wizards were were a 500 ball club. How, what are your thoughts, real quick, on, on this 500 ball club? I believe the first time since 07? It, whenever it was, they just became America's sweetheart, and we actually had a parade down Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. It was pretty nice. Uh, I was I was able to go and join and and watch in the parade because 500 is quite an achievement and so that that was a big at least for the six days that they stayed 500 that was really big um, for the city and the two surrounding states Maryland and Virginia. <laughs> yes, I I got off the uh, airport from Midwest and right away I was greeted with with high fives that the <laughs> the Wizards were back to respectability. Uh, and, and and the thing is, we, we named this, this for those who don't know, we named the show Pixel Roll because Ted Leonsen loves to uh, loves to use positive pixels and pixels as in the internet thing that you see here. So we kind of a play on words. So Ted, if you're watching, what's up, man? Your motivation for the name of this, uh, kind of a Pixel Roll. But we could have named it Cell Wizards because in Cell Wizards fashion, which those of them don't know, they go into a game on Friday night against the Milwaukee Bucks at 500. Favored by nine and a half points, and not only do they lose, they they lose two starters in, in, in the process. Kyle, I mean, I wouldn't even predict that. So, I mean, so Wizards is always lurking. I like to to be a smartass and say that. Did you see? We know we could see this injuries, but you know we can't even, as fans of this team and followers, there can't even be a little bit of success before it just it slaps you back cold reality. No, no, there can't be. And yeah, that Milwaukee loss was especially bad because even guys were referring to it after losing, um, losing this past game. You know, Gortat was talking about like not getting punked by Milwaukee after they lost to the Nuggets. So it, it was one that sticks with the Wizards, and it even stuck with them against Denver and losing on Monday. And it, I think Randy Whitman sort of referred to it after the game in terms of the locker room before the Milwaukee game being too carefree. And I'm sure that filtered in, or that came from a lot of different Wizards or a lot of different guys on the team. But it clearly, like just like we say with this team, it starts with John Wall. So you, you saw the mess, the message being sort of funneled and that maybe Wall was too carefree. And, you know, maybe maybe he was. Maybe a couple guys were. 
maybe Wall should have been the guy who said, you know, something to the entire locker room since he's supposed to be this, you know, budding team leader. Whatever it was, they came out really bad against Milwaukee. John Wall, he didn't, he wasn't sharp in early going. He then actually started to play pretty awesome. Then it became evident that John Wall was the only player who showed up to play. And, uh, and <laughs> after that, it was just, you know, they, they lost it in another overtime game to one of the worst teams. And anytime you go to overtime and another team has, like, your, you know, guys like O.J. Mayo who can fill up the, you know, fill up the hoop, you know, you, you can, you risk losing. So, and the Wizards aren't that good yet. You know, 500 is nice. They're a lot better than they used to be, but they have a long way to go. Well, it's funny you say that. Not only did they lose the game, uh, they were up five with a little under 40 seconds left. John Wall hits a jumper on the left side. I called it a mini dagger I, I, on Twitter. I felt like I jinxed it after after they, they collapsed. He's pumping his chest. He's going, this is my effing city. DC's my city. They immediately give up an easy shot, I believe, to Middleton. Uh, and then the Wizards took another bad shot, and, and they had... The Bucks had the ball, and, and of course, Brandon Knight then hits a three, a game-winning three, and or game-tying three, uh, where Ariza and Wall had some communication issues on the screen. Some Wall goes down, so instead of taking the game winner, Chris Singleton gets the ball in the corner for a game winner. Didn't go. Did, did you think that shot was going in? I thought I had no chance in hell, actually. Uh, you know, I again. The Wizards got another corner three-pointer against the Nuggets, and it was a good look. And I think people kind of are frustrated with this, and they don't really understand, you know, how good or how good of a shot an open corner three-pointer can be. And so people are like, oh, you know, corner three. First of all, that was probably supposed to be Trevor Reza, not, you know, Chris Singleton. I don't know how the play was drawn up, but John Wall is usually going to be going to the right. He's going to be passing to the guy in the right corner. This time, it was a good move by Wall. He drew the defense in. It was, unfortunately, Chris Singleton. He missed a shot. Of course, you had the same situation against Denver where, you know, obviously we know the Wizards had several chances to win that Nuggets game. One of them was uh, Trevor Reese, a three-pointer from that, again, from the right corner. And people are like, all right, why are you shooting right corner threes? I looked at the stats earlier. The Wizards are the only area on the court in the kind of, five main areas. You talk about restricted area, in the paint, mid-range, corner three, or above the break three. The only area where the Withers shoot better is in the restricted area. So you have to think that corner three, they're shooting 43.9% from the corner three. That's a lot better than mid-range where the Wizards as a team are shooting 34.7%. So you almost have to understand that corner three, if Wall can get it open, is a good shot. Unfortunately, they didn't go down we can concentrate on the singleton or a reason shot if we want to, but we all know there are a lot of other kind of bullshit reasons that the that the Wizards didn't do or things that they did do which caused them to lose the game. So it's, you know, it's the shots don't go down. I think the Wizards have to live with those opportunities that they had. Yeah, let's let's get in the bullshit. Let's get in the bullshit reasons. And and, and, and actually it's funny, I, I was talking to the Wizards uh, analytic guy before the game last night, and he we kind of were crunching numbers, and I he kind of confirmed I think the Wizards are the best, one of the top teams in the league at the corner three. I don't know if you knew for sure. Uh, he said they're the, one of the best. I haven't got confirmation. But uh, going, let's, let's go back. So so they lose, they lose a winnable game in Milwaukee, go 9-10. They still have a chance to go back to 500. Last night, Denver. Ty Lawson's out. Our friends, JaVale McGee is out. The, the, the Nuggets are on a road trip. Last game of the road trip. Sometimes teams kind of mail it in at the time. We, me and you were both there. One of the ugliest basketball games I've seen in a long time. The, the final is 75 to 74. The Wizards lose by one point. The Nuggets shoot 41%. Uh, the Wizards shoot 36%. 32 out of 89. From three point, they shot 5 of 24. 20%. Obviously, the Wizards are out without Nene. They're without Martel Webster. They're without Al Harrington. And they're without Bradley Beal. You know, obviously, three of those guys are good three-point shooters, and they're one of their best interior players. Kind of shorthanded, but then the Nuggets were shorthanded. The Wizards took control of this game kind of midway through the third quarter. I think they built a 12-point lead and just kind of let the team back and let the Nuggets back, and then there was a bunch of plays at the end that kind of 
you know, it didn't go the Wizards' way. I, I believe they had like seven turnovers in the last five minutes or something, something crazy. Or is it not, you know, like four turnovers the last seven possessions? What are your thoughts, Kyle, on the game? I mean, we were there. It, it was a really weird game, and yet it seemed bad for two teams that like to push the pace and run. And you look at it, like, for a while, and I'm trying to go through this stat book here, the Wizards, like, barely attempted a free throw, which makes, makes you seem like, all right, they're settling for stuff or they're just not getting to the rim. But you look at Denver's lineup after Fareed, who's not, like, you know, he's not a intelligent defensive player yet. He's just an athletic guy, and he's getting better. But... You know, Wilson Chandler is a good defensive player. J.J. Hickson it isn't. You just wonder what what happened in this game. Why was it such a such a weird back and forth pace? And you know, I, re- I really can't explain it because the Wizards they had a couple of days off. They had both Saturday and Sunday off since after playing Milwaukee. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm still kind of stewing over this Nuggets game. I know the Wizards are shorthanded, like you said. The Nuggets were without. Also, Danilo Gallinari, in addition to McGee and Lawson, um, it, it was a weird <laughs> game, and and I think I have a hard time, other than all the blown chances at the end, I have a hard time understanding like where the Wizards really went wa- wrong, aside from obviously the bench concerns, which is, you know, what poor Randy Randy Whitman was almost like crying about after the game and saying he just can't, <laughs> he's trying to get players rest, he just can't sustain a lead with anyone off the bench, and he's trying a lot of different things, so. It was it was definitely a frustrating loss and one of those things that unless a couple guys get healthy soon like you know Beal or Webster you're like where where is this team going what is going to happen in the next you know four or five or, or eight games to to close out December yeah I mean Nate Robinson let's go for the Nuggets Nate Robinson had 16 points Wilson Chandler had 17 points a lot of those came in the beginning uh, Wall had 20 points Ariza 14 Gortat 16. Uh, Trevor Booker, let's talk about him real quick. He, he probably had one of the better games. The Nuggets are really good. I wrote today, the Nuggets are a really good matchup for him. You know, they didn't, they kind of went small with Fareed and, and, and Hickson and Chandler. And, you know, he kind of sometimes bothers with – he sometimes struggles finishing with whoever's guarding him. Uh, with the Nuggets, he – you know, not a, you know, especially when it's a bigger lineup. The Nuggets had the smaller lineup. He's finished pretty well. He had 12 points, 12 rebounds, a lot of energy, a lot of hustle plays. You know, is, is this something that you can build on? I was wondering, is this, do you see, you know, like you are saying, Whitman looking for answers? I mean, he replaced an A in the starting lineup, I should say, at power forward. Is this something yeah. that, you, is this just a one-game thing? We've seen this with Booker before where he's had these one-game deals. Is there any chance that you can see him maybe, you know, building off of this, or what do you think of his overall play? It's it's definitely something to build off, and even Whitman after saying after the game, he was sitting there thinking like, I need a lot more Trevor Booker's, and it's simple. It's just a simple equation. It's like hustle, and that's really what Booker did. He made his presence felt. He didn't try to do too much. He even got like a couple looks, made a jump shot, um, but he really tried to get points and get rebounds and do all these other things and just embody guys guys out the way. And when you look at other guys on the bench. Jan Vesely is still not strong enough to where he can have a presence felt in the paint. Like, he's going to take contact and go flying nine times, nine times out of ten. And then Serafin, he's just, you know, I, I still can't. I know he's a great offensive player. He has a nice touch. Well, I mean, I don't want to say great offensive player, but he has a nice touch on his shot. <laughs> That's about all. But look, he just doesn't really want to bang. Like, he, he may post up or run across the lane sometimes, but in terms of defense, he just has no clue of what to do past fouling the guy. And I just think he's he's still at the stage of his career, and some guys never get past the stage where he's really thinking about the game too much before he moves. So, so Whitman needs more guys putting up hustle like Booker. Not sure he's going to find them. If Booker keeps up this kind of momentum and doesn't have any mental lapses on defenses, because he can get he can get turned around and lost on defense. Although he and Gortat look like a nice combination, um, at least to start versus Nuggets, definitely something that Booker can build build upon. Because the Wizards are still looking for that you know that guy off the bench, that other big guy who can come in, even when Nene or Gortat are healthy. So you know we'll see how it goes because. You know, Clippers are also coming in town uh, next Saturday, and you know how much Booker loves him some Blake Griffin. So that's going to be uh, – that should be fun to watch. 
Yeah, I think if you Google uh, Blake Griffin and Trevor Booker, I I, I come up immediately. Uh, one of the one of my prouder posts uh, ever on the internet interwebs. Uh, actually, and and there's a gift of a, of Blake Griffin being a cheap artist. Uh, one thing I want to finish on on the on the Nuggets game before going. It's really bizarre because like Nate Robinson, I look at his I look at his stat sheet. He's six of fifteen. He only has two assists. He didn't hit a three. He has sixteen points. Four steals, one turnover, but for some reason, I feel like he imp- impacted this game a lot more than, than, than the really the stats bear out by just watching it. I don't know if it's just because his energy, or it just seemed like he was the only one the Wizards couldn't guard, like the rest of them. I don't well, know. You, said, you I mean, the you same said it. He had those four steals. Those are huge. Those, those make a big impact on the game. And usually when he's stealing the ball, it's going to be in a very Nate Robinson fashion. And I think after Fareed, I could be wrong on this. I'm trying to think. After Fareed had that big block against Wall and they went the other way, I think Robinson was the guy who found him for the dunk and Gortat kind of got lost on defense for a little bit. So, again, Robinson, he, he, you know, he might not – you know, he doesn't start. He might not put up greatest – you know, stats the whole game, but he's there. He's always sort of there with that big assist or steal or bucket when you need it. So that I mean, he was he was a difference, and that was kind of what I was afraid of as as Denver got closer, and and it turned out to be uh, not so good for the Wizards. Well, let's let's talk about let's, two more things before we finish this game and, and move on, because we let's talk about the end. We've referenced it, but let's talk about exactly what happened. The the Wizards are are down. Loud. And they run a they run a pick and roll with with a with a Riza and Gortat. They run a pick and roll with Riza and Gortat. Gortat doesn't roll. Riza thinks he's gonna roll. Riza basically chucks it out of bounds. The Wizards don't get a shot. They're down by one. Uh, or did they turn it? They turned they turned it over and uh, Free got it and they fouled him. That's what happened. So he throws it. Free gets it and they foul him. Now. They foul free. Free misses both free throws. Gives everyone free. Uh, for those who don't know, you get free Chick Fil A. Yeah. So, so, so they get they give them they give them free Chick Fil A. Everyone in the crowd gets free Chick Fil A. Technical difficulties? No, it just. <laughs> Hi Kai. Uh, no, no. So, so basically. So Ariza throws it away. So I don't. It was right. really hard to tell after it, the timeout. I saw Ariza hitting his arm. I never seen him so pissed off. A lot of people took that as he was pissed off at Gortat. I thought maybe he was just pissed off at himself because he had just missed a three uh, possession before that it didn't work out. Free misses both free throws. Now the Wizards call timeout. They get they get the ball again. Now they're running a play. Wall goes down. Gets stripped. Don't get a shot off. So two possessions at the end of the game. The Wizards don't get a shot off. You talked to both of them about you talked to a reason in uh, for uh, a reason Gortat about that play, and I talked to Nate Robinson and you talked to Wall. I talked to Nate Robinson and potentially he foul Wall on the last one. What yeah. did what did Wall and Gortat and Ariza have to say to you? What well, one I went I went back and watched the broadcast and it's almost like Ariza did throw a little bit of a fit. Whether he was mad at Gortat or mad at himself, it seemed like it was ultimately Gortat's fault. But even Phil Chenier was on the broadcast like, all right, calm down a little bit. You don't throw that much of a fit after a blown play. Um, that said, you know, it was, it was certainly like a, a, you know, trying to thread the needle type of pass for a reason because it's going, like, by defenders. Gortat's problem is, is that he sort of was in no man's land along the baseline, and he didn't really get to that open spot right under the rim where Ariza, you know, the pass would have easily hit him. So I think even though Ariza tried to deflect a little bit himself um, when asked about it post game, Gortat totally took the blame, and it was just one of those things where I, I just think the guys miscommunicated. I mean, it was it's a simple sort of screen and roll to the basket type of play, and, and but there's also a, a variety of you know, directions the big man can go or the passer can go, and it's just a miscommunication. Very unfortunate. It seems like, you know, they're still doing the sort of good teammate thing. It was, Again, it was just one of those, like, sort of like a reason to miss from the corner, just one of those things. Um, and about the Wall Nate Robinson thing, yeah, Wall definitely thought he got fouled. Even, I couldn't see it because the play was on the, the other end of the arena. Like, it, it just looked like Wall got the ball knocked away from him, and a lot of people on Twitter were just like, no, he he lost it. 
But Wall was like, no, it, you know, pretty much what had happened then had happened all game. Nate Robinson was grabbing my arm, and I didn't get a call. And I, I went back and looked at the replay. It's, it, from what I saw, I might need to see another angle. It, I mean, it's really hard to tell what, what happened. It does look like Nate Robinson sort of grabbed Wall's arm as he went by him, but it also looked like you know, Wall just sort of lost the ball, or he could have done more to, to control the ball after Robinson tried to foul him. So, I mean, it was really bang-bang play. I'm sure a whistle could be called. I'm sure a lot of whistles could always be blown in games, and it was one of those things the refs had to manage. And maybe uh, maybe Wall just doesn't have the respect yet to, to get the call either. So, so, yeah, it is what it is, Mike Miller style. Yeah, no, it's funny you say that because I look back at the replay. Most people think that it doesn't it doesn't really – you can't really tell. So it's, it's really hard in that case. And then – I uh, asked Nate Robinson, but what's really funny is that, like you're saying that Wall was adamant that he got fouled. And Nate Robinson, when I asked him, was like, whatever, man. Write what you want to write. It's up to you. <laughs> I was like, what kind of answer is that? Like, you could have just said, like, I got a ball. I don't know yeah. if he inferred that I was going to write something bad. I just was like, hey, what happened on the play? Most people would just tell you the truth, right? Yeah, it, it definitely, so it like, I watched, the video, I watched the video that you had that we put up in the D.C. <laughs> Council, and it's definitely, like, it, uh, one of those things where he's so defensive, it was an admission of guilt. But um, but hey, the Wizards are now nine yeah, eleven, he, and uh, I mean, what are you gonna do? They gotta play the Hawks this week, and the the Clippers on Saturday. Yeah, let's go back to 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 you know, you were talking about the bench and and Randy Whitman, what he's going for. The bench was outscored thirty five to five last night. It's been an epidemic all season. I know you have some numbers of. What, what it's like when Wall is on the court and off the court and the dramatic thing. This issue isn't going away. We know who the bugaboo is, but I think that, you know, I feel sometimes that that Mr. Eric Maynard is getting scapegoated because he is really bad, and I'm trying to let him slide. But this is an epidemic that goes far deeper than him. Do you agree? Do you think that as well? No, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, for each game, new game, I almost hope, I really want Maynard to just either fly under the radar or do something good. But he ends up being almost tragically bad. Like, one of his offensively led possession, possessions uh, was fe- fe- featured on Deadspin today for being, you know, the worst NBA play of the year or whatever. So it, it's just like he becomes tragically bad, and it's the focus for all the other bad things that are happening. Because you realize this is only Maynard's first year with the Wizards, you know, Booker, Vesely, Serafin, Singleton, all, the, all these are the whiz kids. They're supposed to be part of the core, the foundation, um, the role players, the guys that the Wizards drafted to be around Wall to help you know, them build this solid core, and they are exa- the exact opposite of solid. So I think we can certainly talk about Maynard and how uh, you know, his stats just look terrible. I think I was like looking up plus-minus stats um, on court, uh, num- on off court numbers, and when Maynard's on the court, the Wizards are minus 27.7 points per 48 minutes. But you also look at like you know Jan Vesely's minus 17.3 points. So it's you know difference between a big blowout or a huge blowout with those two sometimes. So I, I just think I, I don't know what's going to give eventually whether someone gets good because I don't think I'm not, not sure that the Wizards being completely healthy is. Uh, a full answer because you're still going to have a problem of you can't play Wall and, and Beal and Nene these these huge amount of minutes and and not be able to rely on guys coming in and filling in for them. So it, it's even it's just a problem that's going to be kind of around all year unless something drastic well, all, happens. Al Harrington Al Harrington's plus minus was pretty terrible too, right? Yeah, minus. I mean, he's only played 130 <laughs> minutes. But it's minus twenty one point one uh, per per forty eight minutes when he's on the court. So. And what are those stats of the Wall stats on the court, on the court, and off the court? When Wall's on the court, the Wizards are plus five point nine points per forty eight, and the second best Wizard, believe it or not, is uh, well, maybe not believe it or not, is Mar- Marcin Gortat, uh, who's plus five point one. And Wall and Gortat are actually the only two Wizards who've made appearances in all 20 games this season. Um, and then when you look Morgan. further down the list, uh, Nene obviously is an asset. He's plus 4.4 per, per 48 minutes. 
Um, nice, nice use of uh, Mar Marchin. Marchin. Mar Marchin. <laughs> I think it's Marchin, Marchin? maybe. Marchin. Yeah. Has anyone ever asked him yet? Has anyone asked him? So I, I feel like I heard something about Buckhands asked him, and that's why he says Gortat instead of Gortat. You know, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Kevin, you have, you have Kevin, enough. however you want to say it. So, so basically, we're screwed here. I mean, let's talk about Eric Maynard. Like, is he is he arguably the worst player in the NBA? Because I put this out on Twitter last night, and when I when you say when you go worst player, because everyone's like just bench him, and they've tried to bench him. I think he finally got a DMP one game, right? And, and then now he's he's back, and now last night he plays in the first half, and then he does Temple basically take his time because he put up seriously. Go look. I'm trying to get the video to load. and It's not loading for me. Okay, here we go. Hold on. It's going to load right now. He seriously put up the worst shot in the history. I don't know. Do you think it's the his? Is it one of the worst shots you've seen? I saw a live. Shot. He's put up a lot of shots. Depends on what one you're talking about. I okay. saw a live, and I still don't believe it actually happened. Um, All right. Let's 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 see if this thing can load. All right. It's, it's, Showing something on me right now. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, here we go. <laughs> okay. Oh, he's dribbling. Here he's going. He chucks it up. And, oh, of course, it freezes yeah, right Yeah, there. it's just like, that's just a it, point No, guard. watch this, though. Watch this. The ref, look at the ref. He's like eight feet past the, the hoop. He almost catches it. Look at that. I mean, like, <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean... Yeah, he had to throw something up because the shot clock was running down, but that's also a point guard having no clue about where the team is in the shot clock. It just yeah, and and somehow he got further away from the basket as the as the seconds ticked down, and yeah, that was that was vintage Manor time. But but thing is, not just that there was another time where the shot clock's violation went down, and he had to chuck up another like twenty five footer. It wasn't just like this one time. It was too. Do you think he's the worst player in the NBA? Like, it's like here's the question I want to say. Like, before we move on with him, like, because usually you just wouldn't play, right? Like, you would just bench. Like, Vesely, you would just bury him on the bench for weeks. You would just bury someone on the week. I mean, is he the worst guy that's actually playing for the Wizards? I, I can't. I can't. I mean, it's so bad. I looked up Deshaun Stevenson's stats last night. That year that he shot 22 percent from three point, <laughs> and and he shot like 37 percent. But at least with the shot, he was playing some defense. You know, Maynard plays absolutely no defense. You know, and, and, the, and it's hard to hide him too. When you're a point guard, it's not like you're like say your shot isn't falling and you're a wing guy or power forward. When you're the point guard, even on the second unit, like the ball is in your hands. So there's like nowhere to f and hide. That's that's a problem because one, he's a point guard. The Wizards don't have any other choice after Maynard. It's Garrett Temple, and that's like terrible and less terrible. And after, you know, no one else on this team can sort of run the offense necessarily, unless you're somehow depending on Trevor Ariza to do it from the wing or Nene in the post. And so that that's one thing. So if you want to think about if Maynard's the worst guy in the NBA this year, he might be. I know I looked up some stats about guy his his plus minus is the absolute worst among players who played like at least 150 minutes, 160 minutes. But then sometimes you want to think about that argument, like if you had a one-on-one -on -one tournament, would Maynard lose? <laughs> like, would he? Would, like, would every guy beat him? And I almost want to say yes because he's so small. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, he I don't think he off. can. I mean, maybe, maybe Luke Ridnour. Luke Ridnour is sort of old, and I think his plus-minus numbers are also pretty terrible. Of course, you know when you play for a team like the Bucks. Your t your plus minus numbers are going to tend to be pretty bad. I mean, Maynard's playing for a team that's you know two games below 500, but he might he might beat Luke Ridnour. That I think that could be the possibility. But if he's facing like even some sort of foreign, you know, some big white foreign dude, I don't think Maynard's going to beat that guy. I mean, because he'll just back him down to the hoop and score. So um, right now, yeah, considering the, all Nash? the environment, he, yeah. How was Steve Nash? Can you take him off the dribble? <laughs> He would. That would be. I mean, that's. Let Let's put him in a certain age bracket. <laughs> let's do this. Maybe that's how we have to do it. But no, I mean, he. he who knows who's the wor worst player in the NBA? I mean, but he is the worst player who is playing right now. Who's getting sort of at least 
you know, nine to ten minutes a game, he's the, by far the worst. Well, that's what some, someone gave me, like, he was like, I was just saying in recent memory, someone was like, Rasheed Wallace when he played for uh, the, the Celtics at the end, and I mean, all these people they were given, like uh, Luke Walton, someone gave me, Austin Rivers last year, but but the thing is, is that, I mean, also, I guess in the case of Austin Rivers, he's, he's, he's young, but he's a rookie, he didn't know his thing, like, Maynard's a five-year guy. Like, it's like the other people that try to give me are like guys that are like washed up at the end of their careers. Like, like he's literally supposed to be in his prime of his career. <laughs> Supposedly, he just signs a free agent contract. Like, that is, I think, the most mystifying is like there's no real excuses. Like, like seriously, do, I was thinking this. Do you think it's – I mean, obviously, it's mental, right? It, this is completely mental. We've talked about his confidence is shot. I mean, does he need to go see his psychiatrist? Like, yeah, do we need, a, do we need I, a sports psychiatrist going on here? Because I feel like it's not about basketball. Like, he looks on the court like he's never played the game of basketball. And there's no way he's got to where he has in his career as a, I think he's 26, fifth year in the NBA. You know, college player, good player, first round pick, some quality minutes for the Thunder and the, the Trailblazers. I mean, he, this isn't some guy from the D League that has been bouncing around and now he's, like, he has some resume. I mean, I don't think the signing was terrible signing for the Wizards. I think it's an okay signing. And the sense of, like, it wasn't like he's some unknown. He was, like, a decent player. I mean, he literally looks like he has never played the game of basketball. Yeah, I, I don't know, because I think we're getting past the point where you can sort of cite his, his previous knee injury and trying to get acclimated from that. I mean, he, he had time in Portland last year. He's had, you know, summer training camp, whatever. No, the, the Wizards might have to consider a sports psychologist because Maynard, you know, he has a player option for $2.1 million next season. And unless, I mean, <laughs> there could be some weird possibility where he plays so bad that he feels uncomfortable taking his player option. I, I just don't know if that's going to happen because, you know, who knows? He might make he might make as much money in China, you know, with you know, your Lester Hudson's and your Gilbert Arenas's, although he's not there anymore. But, yeah, the Wizards either have to... If this continues, it's been 20 games now, and Maynard's played 19. If this continues, I'm I'm guessing for the next 20 games, maybe they give it the All Star break because again, they what other choice that they have? They're so close to the luxury tax. But if it continues, you know, you either have to cut them or or send them to some sort of you know send them to a shrink or whatever. Because <laughs> it is this is going to lose. This is this is something that could keep the Wizards from the playoffs. I mean, is is there something? That, I mean, I know maybe the players' association has something where he can't do something like this. I mean, is there a way he can be like mental fatigue, or maybe there's something going on in his personal life where they can just have like a leave of absence? <laughs> like, I, I, don't think, I mean, I think I don't know if we want to get to that point yet. I mean, I, you know, talking sports psychologist is one thing, but you're you're sort of getting into the to the mental realm. I, I don't know if we need to go there yet, but. Uh, and yeah, that'll never happen with with the players' union. But it's it's something that I'm sure, and I would be interested to know behind closed doors. I'm sure Leonsis is involved, or so, Grunfeld. Somebody's sweating bullets over this, and they're not just sitting twiddling their thumbs, and they're they're trying to get it. But it's like one of those things. If if you have an NFL kicker who can't hit a chip shot, I mean, do you not do you say something to him? Does it get worse? Do you leave him alone? Like how did how does someone get out of this funk? And maybe. You know, ultimately, it's it's on Maynard's shoulders, and I'm not sure that's that's not very encouraging at this point. But who knows? Everyone likes a good comeback story, right? The thing is, is that the only real analogies I can think of are baseball analogies. Where Rick Ankiel, right, former Nat, you know, he's with the Cardinals, all of a sudden just cannot throw a strike. I mean, it was the most painful thing I remember watching in a playoff game. What was it six, seven wild pitches back, and then all of a sudden it was just like, I'm done. I'm never pitching again. Of course, he would throw dudes out from. You know the warning track when he he somehow made this miraculous comeback as a you know an average baseball player, which is just a testament to how what a sick athlete he was. And my other one is Chuck Knoblock, who was the yeah. second baseman and could not throw it to first base anymore, and he was a Gold Glove winner. I mean, he was like one of the best second basemen in the league, and literally could not throw it twenty five feet. And well, didn't uh, didn't Zimmerman for the Nats last year? Have, I mean, yeah, he, he had he issues throw going it. from third and stuff yeah. like that. So. Yeah, but but that's but can you think of a basketball equivalent? I mean, I can't really think of one. I mean, maybe there's one out there where just you know you're an eighty percent free throw shooter and now you're twenty percent or or I mean, yeah. I mean, usually it seems like when people they flame out like this, there's like some other type of thing, like there's Sean Kemp and eating himself out of the league, or there's some there's a cocaine issue with with some you know like men or alcohol abuse with Ben Baker. Like there, those are the things that where you see a play drop off. Like I can't think of something where 
He and the, and the thing is, the other issue is that that I see, which is unfortunate, why I hate talking about him. And I hope and we've already now rambled on so much, but is the fact that like he is new to the Wizards. Fan bases have the fan base has literally <laughs> zero good good things to base themselves off of. So it's not even like a case where you can be like McGee dunked it or Blotch. You remember when he had that one good game or Nick Young went hot for that quarter. I mean. There is nothing of Eric Maynard that has happened positive for anyone to say anything positive. And so all of a sudden it just seems like the bench has struggled. He's glaring. It's all coming down on him. And and he's it's it's so egregious to the point where he's throwing up he's being mocked on Deadspin by throwing up forty you know, a shot that is ten foot. But that's not even count the the, 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 the floaters he takes that don't even yeah. hit the rim. I mean, we've gone over I think there's a shot in Indiana I'm look I'm looking to probably make a vine of just to show like this isn't like these aren't just like I made a bad pass here or like my shot my three point shooting isn't falling. This is like the most egregious basketball plays I've seen forever. <laughs> yeah, it's it's taken him just 19 games to almost essentially wear <laughs> off the goodwill that he we you know we thought was perpetual when as a member of VCU he beat the Duke Blue Devils in the NCAA tournament and that's obviously like you know with all the Maryland fans or Duke haters in general around here. VCU down fans. in Richmond, you know that that was like that is that was like gold a golden ticket for life, and at least for Wizards fans, re- reluctantly, all those you know that people always remember that well. You know, there are even people at VCU like I don't you know I love Eric Maynard back then, but I have no clue what's going on now. So he it's it's pretty amazing in fact that he's worn off that goodwill in barely you know a quarter of the season. So yeah, it's it's Maynard time. No, and, no, I've had VCU grads make that the same as that point. Be like, you know, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. And they watch a couple of games and they come back to me like, oh my goodness, Adam. Like, he is really bad. I don't know what yeah. happened. But anyway, let's, let's get off of Maynard. Hopefully something figures out. I don't know. They get a psychiatrist. Uh, <laughs> I hate to say that. I just don't understand. There's something going on that, you know, this is, it's not physical. Like, I don't think it's physical anymore. That's why I say stuff like that. But, uh, the next topic is that, you know, the bench, we talk about the benches, it, it kind of segues in. You know, Chris Singleton's back playing. Y'all Vesley's kind of back in the rotation. Uh, Booker had an awesome game last night. Who do you see of these young guys that can possibly make a leap where they can maybe solidify something, maybe maybe even resurrect their NBA careers from an individual standpoint and, and in the process, you know, help their help the Wizards win and, you know, maybe stay here, maybe go on, because basically Singleton and Vesley, both their options were declined. They're kind of playing for their next contracts to stay in this league. So, you know, there's a dual interest there. Those two, we've, we mentioned Seraphin early. He's kind of in a similar boat. And, and Booker, those four, I think, are on a similar boat. I mean, Temple, to a lesser extent, I guess. Your, your thoughts? Well, yeah, all of the draft picks are essentially playing for their life with the team, because Booker and Seraphin will both, you know, if the Wizards decide to extend the qualifying offer to them, um, you know they'll be free agents or they'll be restricted free agents. But we'll see. It's it's tough because none of them have has really stood out. Um, Vesley seems to be the most athletically talented among the four guys. You know he can run with Wall, but he's just such you know we talk about this often. He's such a kitten in the lane, and I, he's so scared of offense is that it actually becomes more of a detriment you know, pass what he can do with rebounds and tip outs and steals, although you really like that activity. Booker, you you like to think that Booker, I would say he, although I really like his game, he is the third most potential amongst the bunch, if not fourth. Um, you know, you like his hustle, but he's he's never going to really, you know, I don't know if he's shown much development in that lefty jump shot, and, you know, he, it's not, if you can't show that, you know, I don't know if his undersized, you know, stature and his rebounding really, really gets him anywhere. Um, I think John, John Townsend and I were talking about the other night on Twitter is that Singleton, out of all those guys, seems to have the most potential. Like, he's a tall guy. He's agile. He might have the, the most potential to be a three-point shooter, although that doesn't show a lot of potential at this point. I think Singleton just seems he's not as athletic as a lot of people anticipated him to be. And he's very mechanical on offense, so you know he has his issues. And of course, Seraphin is just you know he he just he's a gunner. He doesn't see double teams. He doesn't see anything on defense. He doesn't know rotations. So I, it's really tough to know 
which of these guys will come out. It will be interesting to see. Right now, Booker seems to provide what Randy Whitman's looking for, which is rebounding and hustle. Um, but at the end of the season, I can certainly see them maybe trying to continue with, you know, continue with either Vesely or Singleton or maybe Vesely and Serafin and letting, you know, the other two go. I mean, it, it could be the case where you're letting all four of those guys go. I, I can't see that happening so much. I feel like one guy, they might keep one guy. Um, and if I had to bet right now, I would say that one guy is going to be Chris Singleton. Okay. I don't feel good about it, but if I had to throw it out there, is who who I think can actually turn into a solid rotation player who doesn't get the team beat, um, it's going to be him. Yeah, I mean, it's not like there's other. It's not like there's going to be other teams knocking down for the services of, of these four guys. No. <laughs> so it it'd be really, and if there's one thing that we've noticed with uh, with Chad, he's he's a very profitable guy. Uh, regardless of who's making these decisions, and for him to basically jettison four picks of him that he made in the same season, I mean, he'd be. I know that that's not a good reason. No, that's not a reason that anyone that follows the team be a reason to keep any of those people. But I think that that factors in somewhat to basically jettison all four of guys that you've drafted since you've owned in the first round in the same off season. Pretty much, that'd be a. And then you got to replace them. I think that's pretty much you know where you can maybe get them on a cheaper, shorter-term deal, but they're still a wizard. You can still maybe get them to, you know, there's show some value there. So I think that you know I think they could do some of the salary cap. And okay, I would say, I would say Booker. I think I think Vesely's done, and I think Seraphin's done. Seraphin's completely done, unless something really turns around the next, the next twenty games. I think that he's on the bench for the rest of the year. I can see Vesely. Hanging on, but unless I, I did, his offense is so bad, I, I think he'll be back in Europe. And then yeah. I see Book. I think I see Booker potentially hanging on just because he's a hustle guy, and I think that he, they like the toughness, especially from a guy that can come in foul and and be a bruiser. And Singleton, yeah, I think that he's a wild card. I think he's the one that that fit with what they're trying to do, but I don't know if that he's actually doing what <laughs> what they need in that position. Do you see any I can of those that? Do you see no, any of those guys I, getting moved this year? No, I, you're right. There's not a market for, for them. And, and you have to remember, Booker and uh, Serafin were drafted in 2010, <clears throat> excuse me, in Wall's class, and also with Hamadi Njai, who um, had a decent start for the Kings this year. I think they sent them down to the D-League recently. And then Vesley and Singleton were taken in 2011. And then Shelvin <laughs> Mack, who was also taken a second second round, is playing the best out of all those players with the Atlanta Hawks right now. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't they lost think, twice. Yeah, I, I just don't know if the Wizards have a lot of trade value in terms of guys they're willing to trade, and that that includes Ariza, that includes shit Otto Porter, and that includes all these other you know rookies. So. You know, I, I'm not sure there there are any moves to be had there. Although, you know, Ernie Grunfeld has been uh, known to hide some cards or you know some cards up his sleeve. And I would like to bring some breaking news I see on the the Twitter machine. All of a sudden, uh, the Milwaukee Bucks are now on a three game winning streak. So they they have the Wizards <laughs> to thank for helping helping them that get that started. So that was well, very nice of Washington. Yeah. You know, well, also uh, speaking of. VCU players that were terrible. Uh, Larry Sanders has also had a rough season, aside from Eric Maynard. Not, not, not a good, not a good season to be a VCU Ram that that, that follows the Rams in the NBA. Uh, no, do you go? I mean, it kind of goes into the Maynard thing. So you think there's no trade potential with all those? I would agree. So yeah. we kind of didn't yeah. touch on we didn't touch on what do they do with the point guard situation then? If it doesn't, if nothing happens. <laughs> It is there, we can't trade these four players because there's no value. We can't trade a first-round pick because our first-round pick has already been traded and it's protected, and I believe you can't trade a first-round pick twice two years in a row, right? Yeah, I think ultimately what they might do is, first of all, you try to get maybe you know better kind of monitor, balance Beal's minutes, get him playing the point more. And I think they, they might just end up cutting a guy like Garrett Temple, um, even though he's guaranteed money, at least for this season. I think he's, or maybe partially guaranteed. I'd have to go check uh, Sham Sports. I think he is guaranteed for 800000 this year. Um, I ultimately, he might, you know, even though you like him, he plays nice defense, he just doesn't bring as much as he needs to bring. And 
the Wizards aren't, you know, they don't want to cut Maynor because that's going to cost Leonsis too much money. So I think if this continues, you cut Garrett Temple and you find a way. I mean, the estimates look that, like the Wizards are $1.3 million under the luxury tax. I'm not sure how it all works out now that they've, you know, they certainly had Kendall Marshall on their roster and they had Shannon Brown on their roster from the Gortat trade and those guys are now, um, those are guys are now gone, so um, I'm not sure who you bring in, but Temple could find himself on the outs if this sort of this trouble with the backup point guard situation continues. So I mean, he'd be basically the only one that they could get rid of, and they would sign some type of veteran guard for a, the minimum, essentially. Yeah, because you, you're not getting rid of Glenn Rice. I mean, you're not. Yeah. I, mean, I don't. Th- I don't. They could cut Al Harrington now if his knee problems, you know, continue. They could cut him. I mean, that sort of removes that stretch four that you signed for John Wall, so you have to figure out uh, things otherwise, but you know, he's also on a minimum contract, so they could cut him if his knee problems don't uh, don't improve. Wow, so so basically they're screwed. And so so if they go over the the, the, the if they go over the salary cap in any capacity, is it, then they they're over the they're over the salary cap already. I mean not salary cap, but I mean up tax. against luxury tax. And so then is that just because they don't want to be a repeat offender and then the year's out, or is that just because then they would have to pay? Yeah, that's the thing in the NBA. You don't. It's like a clock with the kind of repeat offender type of thing. You don't want to start that clock unless the time you know really counts. And I'm not sure the time really counts at this point. No. So, so the Wizards that yeah they don't want to go into luxury tax territory. It's not just. I mean yeah, it's all about saving money for Leonsis. But if you're thinking practical terms, what this team can do. Uh, to win, you just don't want to jump into that territory um, unless you you really think you're you know on the cusp of being a, a special team or, or a contending team. So so if this is like you know hey there's they need a missing piece this is the one length of, for the championship then then maybe you pay the tax but the fact that that is not the case at all they're not at eleven in the poor East then that's why you don't even think about it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right, so you, you mentioned you mentioned there's two games this weekend. Uh, the Clippers on Friday, right? And, oh no, yeah, no, Atlanta. Atlanta, Atlanta on Friday and Clippers. And the Clippers at home Saturday. Yeah. Give it to me. Give me your quick quick preview thoughts. So the, the Hawks, they uh, they actually played the Thunder tonight, and I think they ended up losing. It was a close game. Um, so the Hawks will have you know they'll have Wednesday and Thursday off before playing at home. Um, they played Oklahoma City, also in Atlanta, uh, and I think they're just going to be looking for revenge. It's one of those, you know, could go either either way. The Wizards might have won. Um, they might have beat Atlanta just simply because they're on their home court. This could go a different way down there. It'll probably depend on, you know, Beal's been cleared to quote unquote ramp up activities. The other night, Randy Whitman, you know, didn't know what that meant yet, um, but you could you could maybe understand if Bill. Uh, gets a couple of days of practice this week. He might be available for the Hawks game. Martel Webster could be available for that game too. And and uh, hey, who knows if if the spirit sort of you know lift <laughs> Nene, he could be available too. So so the Hawks game is probably a very it's it's a game they really need to get because again you know the Clippers are certainly a strong team. They're not they're not invincible, but you want to try to get that win on the road that seems to help you recover after two very bad losses before you can, you know, have a chance to protect your home court because um, the reality is that the Wizards have eight games left in December and six of them on the road, so these are, this is not the easiest stretch. Yeah, I think they play the Nets and the Celtics on the road during the stretch, but, I mean, the Celtics are playing well and the Nets can, you know, beat anyone at any given point, although they seem very bad. It's just you can't count on games like that. So, uh, you know, hopefully all those guys get healthy for this weekend. Yeah, no, I mean, after the Hawks and the Clippers this weekend, they go at the Knicks, at the Nets, at the Celtics, and at the T-Wolves. And then we have, then there's a home and a home and away with the Pistons. So basically five of their next six are, uh, are on the road. With some, with some technical difficulties. Tell Kyle, we're, we got, we're almost done in two minutes. Man, jeez. Yeah. You put a put a ring on it. That's what happens. Can well, we, can no, we talk you, about basketball? Well, you can't. I mean, I am interrupting her viewing of the Victoria's Secret fashion show. Is that tonight? Yeah. The Angels? Yeah. It, the Angels? Yeah. And so, can you, I need to go see that too. Yeah. So let, let's wrap this shit up, huh, Adam? Oh, okay. Oh no, I agree. I'm, I'm looking <laughs> for. I I think they're gonna lose in Atlanta and. Uh, 
they haven't played well in Atlanta forever, and the only time they did play well, it was a tragic loss. And the Clippers game, I don't know. I can see them actually sneaking out the Clippers game. If they can get maybe if, if Nene comes back or one of those guys come back, I don't think the Clippers are or that are playing that well on the road. Uh, I think that that's a sign. I do have one funny tidbit I wanna I wanna talk about. Are you, are you okay with that? Let's do it. Okay, so Mr. Javel McGee, Pierre McGee, uh, he was in the locker room last night when I was before and after the locker room. He was in there eating a chipotle a bowl, I believe it was chicken. Uh, I really don't like Javel McGee. He's kind of a jerk. We don't really need to go into all those reasons. Uh, it's not really even kind of professional covering reasons. He's never really been. It's not even. A, I don't know. He just comes across as a not a very nice guy to to the people around him, teammates, yeah. everyone. Kyle, yeah. I think you would agree with that. No, I, uh, it, it's funny because I think you know people fall in love and think he's this great you know person on Twitter. I'm like you know give me a fucking break. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, go. I won't name this local reporter, um, yes. you know who who covers the the team. But it was one of those things. It's like oh, so you're gonna go try to talk to you know Javel? He's in town, and, and the guy's essentially like, well, I didn't even like covering him and asking him questions when he was in D.C. So <laughs> I re- especially don't want to go talk to him now. And 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 he's just, you know, the media is what it is around Javel, but he's also kind of a dick. And so, you know, good riddance. Yeah, yeah I agree. I mean, I've already asked him questions last time about DC, and he was just like, whatever, I don't care, whatever. So I was like, listen, I don't even want to ask you questions before the game. So I t- actually talked to Darrell Arthur and Wilson Chandler just about all sorts of stuff. So after the game's over, I'm trying to ask some questions about Jordan Hampton because Javel didn't, uh, and he's, 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 she's, he had taken a shower, so he's getting he's the last guy. He's getting dried off. It's literally I'm the only media person left in this room. Javel's over here uh, on his phone. Seriously, I mean like five five two feet behind me. So finally I was just like, Hey Javel, like how's your injury? Trying to be a nice guy. Like just kinda of shoot the shit. Like, hey, how you doing? When he's back. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I was like, What is your phone? Fo- oh blah, blah. then they're like, Well, when do you expect? In the year or next year? He's like, I don't know. Blah, blah. I'm like, Well, what have you been doing for rehab? Oh, like a bone stimulator. I'm like, okay. Finally, I was like, how's your mom? How's your sister? They're good. Uh, uh. I'm like, then I even went one more, Kyle, one more. How is she doing at Texas? Because I know she played basketball at Texas. I was like, hey, was she a sophomore there? You'd think that the fact that I would know those kind of things would make you believe that, like, hey, this isn't just a normal dude. Like, he's asking how my sister's doing in college, and he knows she plays somewhere and knows, you know, she's at this age. And, and he didn't even look up at me, mumbled, all right? So after the game was over, I didn't really say, I didn't go into that detail, but I put a tweet out that says, my brief encounters with JaVel tonight did nothing to change my view that he is my least likable NBA player, which is very funny, right? A couple people responded, kind of made the point that you made, like, what do you mean? I think he's really funny. Yeah. I think I, I think I read Deadspin too much, right? His jug life and all that stupid shit. Well, Trevor Booker's mom, she responded to my tweet because <laughs> follow, she follows me on Twitter, and she said, he is very rude, exclamation point. Huh. Bumped, into, bumped into me and didn't bother saying sorry or excuse me. So I responded. I thought it was really funny that, that, that at like 1239, Trevor Booker's mom's t- tweeting me back about how Javel, she agrees. And then, dude, come on, dude. Really, Javel, like, your teammate's mom, you bumped into her and you didn't say sorry? Like, like, I mean, like, even my boys, like, you can be my boy's friend, my boy's sister, like, your friends, anyone that you just met, like, early in the bar. Like, you would see their parents or relative, you'd be like, oh, sorry, like, oh, hey, hey, how you doing? You're, like, bumping to First of all, German Booker's the wrong person to be messing with his mom, too, by the way. <laughs> but then I right. respond, I responded, uh, I can yeah, I can see that. I nicely asked him about his injury, his mom and sister. He mumbled, never looked up to me. Wow, SMH. Sounds like he needs an etiquette class. <laughs> is how is how Tracy Tracy ended that. So just wanted a little add to I know people that stayed here for the last forty minutes will probably love that that's how we ended. But uh, I know Kyle needs to get back. He's ruining his his uh, wife to be's time with angels, and uh, and I miss I miss you, Kai. What you gonna do? Right, <laughs> Kyle. Pass. Any last words before we go? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm still still Nine trying 13? to get over that. Still trying to get over that Nuggets loss. 
nine, and you know, I say people get healthy and they sneak one of these two wins. So they'll, they'll be they'll be ten and twelve after the next two games. That's my and prediction. Going into that big that would be a big stretch of that road game. Yeah, you know, they got to go four and two in those six games. So they they definitely before you know it. I mean, this team I don't think you can go. You can't get four or five down because then the media and it's even when they're nine to nine, the media's already like pumping them up. The Express has them on the cover. Have the team turned around? I was just like, chill the, like, can there be no chilled out of like any commotion? And I know I'm probably guilty as charge. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably the biggest flamer there is, so I should probably criticize myself. But you know, I'm I'm emotionally invested in this, Kyle. So that, you know, I overreact. So so you know, it happens. It happens. Uh, any any parting words? Until next time. So wizards. So wizards. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for staying with us. And uh, peace out. Five deep. Five deep. <laughs>